Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session today. It's the 10th of September, 2023. I'm feeling a little punchy today. I'm warning you in advance. <laughs> I hope you're all doing really well out there. Um, it's great to see you all here. Uh, and thanks for joining us here. We've got people coming in from all over the world. Paul from Poland. we got Jurgen from Kansas City. Mark from Texas, where it's a mere 87 degrees. That's a nice change for you, Mark, I'm sure. <laughs> um, all right, let's go over to our agenda and cover what we're going to cover today. So I just received the Rode Wireless Pro. Um, I was actually on vacation, got back Thursday, uh, picked up the Wireless Pro. We had it held and... Um, I've done only two things with it so far. I've unboxed it and I've updated the firmware. That's it. So I'm not usually a fan of unboxing videos, but we're gonna we're we're going to explore for the first time in my hands the wireless pro today. So I don't have a lot of answers yet. This is how I would this is how I go about evaluating a product when I first get it. Um, so I just wanted to warn you if you were here because you were expecting a full review, I don't want to waste your time. You're welcome to be dismissed and go do something more useful with your time if that's if that's what you're looking for. Otherwise, if you're here, if you want to explore, uh, stick around. This will be some fun. All right. Um, first, a piece of interesting news. I reviewed a while back the Mackie DLZ Creator. And in fact, that's what we're using today for our audio again. Um, I'm using the Earthworks Ethos into the DLZ Creator and then line out from that into my Canon C200 camera. And they have released a new firmware update, which is really quite interesting. This new firmware update adds NDI audio functionality and, um, and also multi-language support, which is good as well. Um, but the NDI is a really interesting feature. So that Ethernet port that's on the back of the unit um, that we didn't have a lot to do with, actually had nothing, it did nothing <laughs> when they first launched it, now is capable of com of uh, sending NDI audio. So you can send, you can essentially have one, maybe you have a, a live stream, you can have a host in one location, a host in another location. If they both can send NDI audio, you can then mix that together for your live stream. OBS has an NDI plugin, so it can receive NDI audio. Um, it's a pretty exciting addition to the Mackie DLZ. So we'll be covering that a little bit more in the future. We don't have anything to talk about on that right now, but more to come here in the next little bit. Just wanted to throw that out there. All right, again, Rode Wireless Pro, we're going to do first impressions. The full review will be coming in a few weeks when I have more time to invest in it. We just finished a Sony UWPD wireless system review. Great system, especially for those of you filming with Sony cameras that have the MI shoe. Seems like a really nice integrated package um, for an audio system or a wireless microphone system that, that works well. It's um, it's on its fourth generation, so they've had a lot of time to kind of iterate and refine, and it's working pretty nicely. All right. Um, after that, well, we did have several questions that were submitted ahead of time. Some of them I can answer again. Some of them are about Wireless Pro that I don't quite have the answers yet, but I will uh, note those for my final review. So we'll take a look at those in just a little bit. So with that, let's head on over to the overhead cam, and let's take a look at the Wireless Pro. So it comes in a couple of different cases here. There's a charging case, and you can tell the charging case, it has this USB-C port and a little button on the back to check the status there. Um, and so, of course, you can... <laughs> Interestingly, the, the charging case has its own firmware. I just connected this to uh, Rode Central to do the updates, and actually it looks like there's a little something on the... some protective thing over the little zip pull here. Um, we'll take that off another time, but um, you plug this in, you you have the, the transmitters and the receiver in this case, you plug in a single USB-C port and you can see all of them in Rode Central and be able to configure them, which is nice, and also update the firmware. So that's how I updated the firmware here um, this morning. The, the case also has a firmware. I don't know <laughs> what they're planning to do, but that gives them some options for the future, which is pretty interesting. So we're seeing a lot of this move toward products where they're yeah, road in particular does a lot to enhance their products with firmware over time so all right here's 
here's the case when you open it up and we have the receiver and then the two transmitters here and they connect via USB-C in the case itself so you can see there's a little USB-C connector down there which is a little different than for example the DJI system which instead of connecting via the USB-C port it has a proprietary uh, set of contacts and a magnet so you can just drop them in there and it uh, it lines them up this is a little bit different where you actually get it and uh, onto the USB-C terminal there and connect that up like that um, all right so once we pull those out here's just a, a look at here is the receiver first of all uh, let's pull out the transmitters there's transmitter one and two and it looks like they are connected and sending audio already so out of the right out of the case they go ahead and looks like they're already um, paired up so they're ready to go there in this other case here let's take a look um, it's nice that they have a space for all of the accessories which sometimes that's a frustrating thing I found with some of the other systems like this where they put the they had a case for the transmitters and receiver but nothing <laughs> no space for everything else which you need and the nice thing about the wireless pro is it does actually come with um should be in here here they are two of the Rode lavalier twos so pretty good lavalier microphone and it does have a locking plug and on the transmitters there are threads to attach that which is really nice as well so you're not going to have the pullouts that is probably that's a pretty common request i saw come in with the wireless go to was hey i've pulled these out a bunch of times really would prefer to not have that so the warning here of course is that they're using kevlar in the cabling and so it's a potential laceration and strangulation risk evidently so they put that on there let's go ahead and get my scissors and we'll cut that off one of the most important tools for a production sound mixer i've found scissors it is part of my lavalier hiding kit and without cutting the cable itself we got that off and let's get this one off as well okay good there all right connect that one up as well so of course it does have an inbuilt microphone but um, it also comes with the lavaliers which is nice because then you can you can hide this i for vloggers it's probably fine to have this in the frame but when i'm doing interviews for example corporate interviews i wouldn't want to have this in the frame i would prefer to have the lavalier microphone and of course it comes with the foam covers the alligator clips and the little rings that um, have the colors on them so that you can identify which is which nice little touch there and this appears to be a microfiber cloth or a yeah microfiber cloth um, these are pretty shiny uh, i did see caleb pike's review of this and you can see they they reflect a lot if you get them at just the right angle so evidently this microfiber cloth is to make sure that when they do reflect it's uh nice and clean <laughs> okay that's great uh, let's see what else we've got in the bag here so microfiber cloth with with the road branding on it thanks for that road uh, let's see what else we've got here we're going to move these out of the frame a little bit here are the ca cables it looks like to connect the receiver to various devices so for the hybrid cameras and others out there we have a 3.5 millimeter trs to 3.5 millimeter TRS, so stereo mini jack. It's going to go into most of the cameras that many of us are using. Um, we also have a USB C to USB C, so if you're working with an Android phone, I think that's the idea for that one. Um, and there's a USB C to Lightning for those using iOS devices. And I suppose the USB C could also be for iPad Pro. Then, of course, we have a the bigger USB C to USB C cable, which is for connecting the charging case and charging it and communicating with your computer so that's what 
is included there. That's all good. Get you connected to everything you need to connect to. We do have the magnetic clips. So let's see how this works. I guess you slide that little metal sheath on there, which is good. I did on my wireless go to, I did break one of, I actually broke the one on the receiver at one point trying to get it out of my camera shoe. I had it in a Panasonic GH5. It was a really snug fit and it, I don't remember what happened, but somehow it broke, which was sad. So having the metal sheath is probably a good thing. And then what you can do is use this magnet to mount it. So you can put the magnet underneath the clothing and it will attach to that, which is nice. So two of those, one for each. We have a little documentation on the lavalier two. So this is the regulatory and safety guide. Okay. Come back into the case over here. Ah, we have some wind covers. In fact, it looks like there are a bunch of them. By the way, uh, this is a kit I bought. I did not, this was not sent to me by road. I purchased this with my own money. Um, so this is what you can reasonably expect. I, I'm trying to do that as much as I can because I think it represents better what, um, what you, you know, if you were to go buy this, what you would get. So just checking these here to see how, I mean, presumably you would do, you would put that on if you're not using the lavalier too. So I'll take that off of here. And I think it's a twist. Yeah, it's a twist lock. That goes on pretty nicely. We'll do some tests to see how well that, uh, that does out in the wind. The Wireless Pro includes Rode's um, fourth generation wireless 2.4 gigahertz system in it. So um, I believe that's the same system that the Wireless Me is using, if I'm not mistaken. So we did some tests on that already. So we have a sense for how well this is going to work. In fact, one of the questions that came up earlier, I'll just go ahead and see if we can jump ahead to this. I'll come back to that. But Chad's question was, I'm curious if the improved Wi-Fi transmission is reliable with the transmitter placed on someone's back, the normal placement, <laughs> um, with their body between the transmitter and receiver. Usually outdoors is where it fails because I guess the Wi-Fi can bounce off the walls and get around the body when it's indoors. Previous iterations of the road and DJI mini wireless units had a less than reliable result in outdoor wedding shoots. I realize that you can record the audio internally, but I'd rather have reliable Wi-Fi. If you have time, maybe do a range test with the transmitter behind the subject. That would be very helpful. Chad, that's exactly what I intend to do for the final review. That'll be posted on my channel, Curtis Judd, <clears throat> as opposed to this channel. Um, but yeah, I agree. That's the that's one of the challenges with um, with these 2.4 gigahertz systems is that they don't they 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 generally, they're, they're great because they're digital. The transmission is, um, the audio that they can send is quite clean. But uh, that that's a narrow slice of bandwidth that you get to work with in 2.4 gigahertz. It's unlicensed. Any device can use it. Uh, anyone, that releases, anyone that releases a product that uses that frequency, at least here in the United States, has to agree that, hey, uh, you're on your own. <laughs> There's too much going on. Uh, there's nothing that can be done about it. So um, that is the, the kind of the Achilles heel. So there was also a question that came up here that I want to address here. KM Wong left this actually before the stream started. What would you change or add to the new wireless pro to make it perfect for pros? I think that's worth talking about for just a moment here. I, I know Rode is probably just following the suit of Apple and lots of other companies, but I, it it rankles me a little bit when Apple releases a phone and they call it the iPhone 14 Pro, um, and I and I when they first started doing that I kind of went, huh? How's a phone Pro? It just seems like an abuse of the the term. Um, and what I mean by that in practical terms is if you go into a set of a scripted narrative film that has a budget of greater than 
$200,000, which would be a micro budget feature film, they're probably not using these as their primary wireless microphone system. It's it's not a dis, it's not, I'm not criticizing Rode for that, it's just not what they do. Um, because they, they're probably using a UHF system of some sort, which can penetrate walls better, which can tra generally transmit farther outdoors, which will allow them to add additional antennas that they can stick up on a mass, log periodic dipole array antennas, um, and multiple of them using uh, true diversity wireless microphone systems. There's just a lot of things. I mean, this, when, when Rode says wireless pro, it, it's not that kind of pro. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Um, will you see this in use by news crews? Probably. You probably will. Even on things like BBC or um, other major news outlets, you probably will see these. So from that standpoint, I guess you could consider it pro. Um, I think what's also pro about it is the fact that it comes with lavalier microphones. So they're not anticipating that most people using them are just going to, you know, do this, um, which is, again, perfectly legitimate if you're vlogging or even in news that's you, you see that in the news sometimes um, but i think for those that are trying to do something that looks a little bit more polished they would rather have a lavalier microphone that they could clip on somebody so in any case that's my that's my little soapbox rant on the use of the word pro road is uh, you know i i blame apple for that largely i think they were the first one i saw where they well there are probably lots of other companies before that that do it too, but I really see this as a consumer wireless system that could be used in a limited number of professional capacities. Could you use it for corporate video? Probably, yeah. And you could probably get away with it and it'd probably be fine. If you're just doing interviews and you're going to be working within three meters of the talent, I don't think, you're probably not going to have issues unless you're in a super Wi-Fi saturated or super 2.4 gigahertz saturated con um, area. But um I have had a few problems in some office areas where there's a lot of Wi-Fi going on. But um, anyway, those are some thoughts there. So let's get back to the overhead here and take a closer look at what else we have here. So that's everything in the, the accessories case. Um, it looks very similar, except it doesn't say Wireless Pro on the top. The accessory case. So the charging case does, the accessory case does not. Otherwise pretty similar. Looks like they're about the same size. They're kind of a semi-hard case, which is, that's nice. I think Rode did a nice job there. Um, there is a firmware update. So even when I just got it out of the, um, out of the box on Thursday, I got an email from one of my contacts at Rode and they said, hey, I saw that you're going to do a live stream. You might want to make sure you do the, you update the firmware first. And the firmware update actually has to do with uh, time code and um, the level of time code that you output from from the device here. So we'll take a, a little bit more of a closer look at that. Now, I, uh, as far as I can tell, and let's go over to the Mac, take a look here. As far as I can tell, the, the time code, it, I don't think it has a temperature compensated crystal oscillator, which is what you typically see in a time code box. But what it does do from what I can tell, let's just see if we can find the time code section here. Using time code with the wireless pro. Here we go. Okay. All right. So it's using standard SMPTE time code, which is good. Um, and it writes, you know, it, it, it outputs linear time code. So that's the mo most widely used format today. That's great. Um, the Wireless Pro receiver acts as the source in a timecode setup, meaning that timecode is generated by the Wireless Pro and is received by other sync devices, such as cameras and audio recorders. The Wireless Pro outputs timecode information as an audio signal. If your camera accepts timecode, it will record this data into your video files directly. But if it doesn't, then you can still record this audio timecode signal into your camera's mic or aux input, just like you would like a, would a microphone. The audio is then later recognized as timecode in your editing software. There's a lot of nuance here we'll talk about in just a moment. <clears throat> the Wireless Pro receiver will automatically send timecode to the transmitters, so the recordings on your transmitters will have the timecode baked into them and be perfectly synchronized. 
but you need to record the time code onto your cameras so that your video files have this sync information. Okay, so let's actually pull up the app. So the Rode Central app is right here. And let me just pop these back into the case. And we'll come back to the overhead here so you can see what I'm doing. We will pop these back in. So here is the receiver, which goes on the right-hand side like this. And then each of the transmitters, we'll pop those in. Can it go into the case with the mag? Yeah, it can, even with the magnetic uh, thing on the back. That's cool. So then we'll get our USB-C cable, and I'm going to pop this into the computer. And you'll see it should show up here on the app. Okay, and there they are. Um, you can see here the charge case has a firmware. <laughs> that was the thing that made me uh, chuckle just a little bit, but that's that looks like they're uh, planning on doing some things with that. I wish I could make this bigger. Sadly, as far as I can tell, it is a fixed size. No, Command Plus doesn't do anything. Okay, well, um, is there anything I can do to make the background a little easier for you to see. I don't know if that's any better. Okay, well, we'll we'll just go with it. So you come into the routing or routing, depending on which part of the world you live in, I believe. Um, no, it's not in there. Ah, here it is, time code. So you can turn time code on and it gives you, first of all, a frame rate setting here. So of course you have to set the frame rate to the same frame rate you're using on to record on your cameras of course, and it has the options, the standard options from 23.98 frames per second up to 30 frames per second. Good. Um, some people say, hey, I'm shooting at 59 or I'm shooting at 60. How do I do that? You use the lower uh, multiple of that. We'll get you in the ballpark there. Um, real time. I am not sure what the real-time setting does. Let's take a look. Apologies for the motion here. Talks about forever. You can choose to generate the Wireless Pro's time code in real-time or, or as a continuous mode in which you select the start point. Real-time mode reflects the actual time in your region. Okay, so that's basically um, time of day. Free run is basically what that is. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to read in this 24-hour format where the, these are hours, minutes, seconds, frames. Okay. All right, so that's all that does. I would just normally leave that in real time. So we can switch back over here. So that's going to use time of day, basically. And here's where it has the, the clock is currently set Sunday, September 10th. 1224, we can actually have it resync. Most computers nowadays, when you boot up the operating system, will connect to a time server and actually update their clocks. So that's going to be accurate enough for us. So that's how the time code generally works. Um, you can also tell it what to put. So now that we've turned time code on, you can see in the routing or the routing menu, we have some additional options here. Um, so what we can output here, for example, is we can Let's see here. Merged audio is output on the left and time code is output on the right channel of both the TRRS and the USB. So here's the challenge. I'm going to I'm going to switch back. If you're working with a camera which does not have a dedicated time code input, you are going to need to keep this connected. Um, and you're going to need to convert what re gets recorded as audio timecode in the camera to metadata timecode that then your video editing app can use to sync, to, to, to recognize that as timecode. The only free app out there that I'm aware of that does that is DaVinci Resolve. And I'll be honest, it does it kind of badly. Um, or well, No, it doesn't do it badly. It does it unreliably. Um, <laughs> this has been my experience. The best app I've seen out there for this is the Tentacle Sync 
um, Studio app. And that comes free if you buy a Tentacle Sync Studio or Tentacle Sync device, or you can purchase a license for it independent of a device if you choose to do that. It has a lot more options. So here, here's the thing that I'm concerned about and why I just spent all that time talking about that. If I come back over to the Mac here, let's look at the different options here. So here it's going to put audio on the left and time code on the right channel. I have to check that I'm not sure whether DaVinci Resolve will recognize the time code on the second channel or the left or the right channel. Um, sometimes these apps require they're expecting to see time code on the, the first channel or the left channel. Um, so we'll have to do some experimenting with that and see how it works. But that's one thing to keep in mind. If you're having trouble, consider that. So it gives you all these different options here. You can see here, for example, the 3.5 millimeter output. Audio is sent out both left and right. The headset, merged audio's output. And then, oh, and then it puts out time code to the USB. That's interesting. I'm not sure 100% where you would use that, but that's interesting. And same here, you can put out time code to everything. So you have a few, excuse me, a few different options here. That's fantastic. So they've, they're they they're making it flexible. Good on you, Rode. You can also, of course, uh, coming away from time code for a moment, you can record safety tracks and you have a, a variety of different options there. You can split the audio so that transmitter one goes to the left channel, transmitter two goes to the right channel, um, or you can merge them all together. So they're basically dual mono. So both transmitters will go to both the left and right channels on the output um, and apply that to your camera or your phone. So it looks like some good options there. That looks, that looks all right. No, no issues there. A couple of different gain modes. You have uh, manual. This is, again, this is on the receiver. So this is the output. You also have some presets where you can um, choose the type of camera. So for example, if I were using a, um, I guess, Pan oh, Panasonic is there at the top. If I'm using a GH5. And then it gives you a little thing here telling you kind of how to optimize for your GH5, evidently. Oh, okay, cool. That's that's good. That's helpful for people setting it up the first time, I think. So now I have that as a preset here, if I just want to do that. In essence, it turns the, it just sets the gain to a preset level, is all that's doing from what I can tell. You do have the ability to um, dim the backlight. And you can define what the button, the road symbol button does. It can either add a marker to your recording or it can start and stop recording or it can do nothing. Um, I wonder how you lock it. That'll be something I'll need to explore a little bit here. On the transmitters here, you can change the colors. Let's actually pull the, pull the case back up here. Give me just a moment. No, that doesn't make any sense. If I pull the case back up here and it's not connected, um, <laughs> that's not going to work. Let me go get a longer USB-C cable. Okay, this hopefully will do the trick here. So I'm going to grab the case here. And let's get this cable connected to the back of the case so we can kind of swap back and forth, show you the app, Road Central, and what is happening to the receiver and the transmitters in real time. Okay, they're connected again. So let me go to the overhead camera. And if I go to one of the transmitters, evidently I can change. Actually, let me let me go back to the computer so you can see what I'm looking at here. 
Um, this is where you can You have presets here, evidently. Interesting. So I guess you can change what you export. We're gonna go, I would go to custom, I would set it to wave. 48 kilohertz, 32-bit float. You can actually loudness normalize it for you, or you can turn that off. Interesting. Um, so that allows you to export. It's my understanding you can also just connect via USB. Let's see if that how that works here. I go to the Wireless Pro. Uh, uh, presumably the files that you've recorded would just show up right here in the Finder. Um, so that simplifies things a little bit. With the Wireless Go 2, you had to use the Rode app to export audio from one of the transmitters that recorded. Um, now, it's, it's my understanding you can just connect to USB and should be able to do that. Oh, here we go. Here are the settings for the transmitter. Okay, I see. So when you come in, it just shows the recordings. If you click the gear, then it brings you into the settings. Okay, so the gain assist, you can set it to three different settings. You can turn gain assist off, or you can, and then you can manually set the gain for your mic, or you can set it to gain assist auto, gain assist dynamic, which apparently retains more dynamic range, does it's less, less heavy handed in terms of its automatic gain algorithm. And then again, you can turn that off entirely and control the gain yourself. So a few different options. These worked okay. Yeah, they also have this on the wireless me and my experience there was it's okay. Not, not a bad feature. Um, so there's that. Um, right now on this particular transmitter, it looks like the road symbol button is to mute the microphone. Ah, uh, you can also adjust the LEDs. You can make them bright or dim. It'd be nice if you could turn them off altogether. But let me just show you the difference here as I... Yeah, let me see if you can see this. I'm going to go back to the overhead camera. As I change that setting, watch these LEDs right here. That is bright. That's dim. Bright. Dim. Just to give you a sense there. All right. Um, you can set the, the recorder on the transmitter to automatically uh, record. So basically, it's always as soon as you turn it on, it's going to start recording. I think there are some wedding videographers that like to have that. <laughs> Just so it goes and you, you're not worrying about You can record up to 40 hours with the inbuilt memory. So it's not as if you're... Um, it's, not a, it's not a big deal. Uh, or 44 hours, it actually says here. And then when enabled, dropout zones and markers will be shown. So if there is a dropout, what this automatically does is adds a, mar a metadata marker to the audio file um, so that you can quickly find it. So if you're, if you're editing the audio that you recorded to your camera from the receiver and you notice, oh no, there was a dropout, um, this file that gets recorded to the transmitter will have a little marker in it. So pretty cool. Okay, we need to take a pause here and take a look at the chat, see what's going on there. I haven't looked at it. I'm operating solo today. Um, so let me just kind of catch up here. <laughs> All right. Patrick asks, $399? Yes, it is. A, the kit is $399, which includes two transmitters, receiver, a dual channel receiver, two Rode Lavalier, two microphones, the fur covers. Oh, I see. The fur covers are two. Uh, two of them are for the Rode Lavalier, and the others are for the... And actually, they give you an extra one. The others are for connecting directly to the transmitters if you're using the inbuilt microphones. Um, includes all the cables, the three cables that you would presumably need to connect to an Android or iPad Pro, uh, most hybrid cameras, and to an iOS device. That includes the foam covers for the lavaliers, alligator clips, microfiber cloth, charging case, USB-C to USB-C cable, a short one actually, um, this long, for charging the case and communicating with the computer. 
and then the accessory case for $3.99. That's correct, Patrick. Um, Christopher says that the DLZ NDI is far more interesting and important than the Wireless Pro. <laughs> In your world, I'm sure it is, and for uh, some of, many of us, it, it may be, but I think the Wireless Pro is uh, a lot of people are wanting to know about that, which is why we're covering that today. All right. Although I would have preferred Dante instead of NDI Audio. Yes, uh, NDI, I think, is more of an open standard. I think with with Dante, typically you have to come, the manufacturers have to work with Audinate to actually integrate their controllers, I believe, into the devices. So there's a, there's a, there's a higher cost involved for the manufacturers if they're going to do Dante versus NDI, which often that cost gets passed down. Um, so anyway, Mark says, agreed, guessing the IO will have to be via Dante, but at least a card slot would be cool. Um, Walter says, I like the Rode Wireless Pro time code and 32-bit flow. It works in the United States. So yes, for I, I didn't, I don't know if I've mentioned it, but yeah, I guess, I guess I have, but the transmitters record at the same time that you're transmitting. So they're not, um, up against the same patent issues that we're seeing with some of the, the higher end wireless systems, patents held by Zaxcom. Um, and they're really nuanced. And I think what it, what it comes down to is if the transmitter has removable media, memory media, then that's where it becomes a problem from a patent standpoint, which is a little bit funny. And I think that's how Rode gets around it, or at least, yeah. Another question that's come up is, well, wh why is this even a thing? Like, who's going to enforce this? It's not like you're going to be out filming somewhere and the police are going to show up and say, you're, you're using a device that is violating a patent. Um, that's not how, that's not the issue. The issue is, is that the company, the manufacturers, Zaxcom as the defender of the patent and whomever um, Zaxcom deems is violating their patent, um, they would end up in court. And that we've seen, uh, we've actually seen one company already go out of business from that. Do if some of you may remember the company Juiced Link. Um, very small company, just one guy, engineer, that was making these devices and made some really good audio interfaces for cameras. Um, he made a body pack recorder and evidently ended up going to court with Zaxcom and couldn't continue to operate, so had to shut down. So that's how it's usually enforced, um, just for those that are, that are curious about it. Patrick, thank you so much for the super chat. Very much appreciate that. Time code out only at the moment, which worked great as a time code generator to Tentacle Sync E. Yeah, so you can jam this with another system like <clears throat> a camera that can take time code, like any of the Blackmagic pocket cameras or any of the higher end Black Blackmagic cameras. The thing is, is that if you don't leave it attached and continue sending time code to it, um, they're going to drift very quickly. So at that point, the time code becomes more of a get you in the ballpark kind of thing. So if you're recording or doing a long form recording, um, it'll just make it easier to find the sync point, but you'll still have to nudge it and get it perfectly in sync. Um, if you leave it attached to the camera the entire time, the, the receiver, and send out time code, then it will actually be writing time code to the audio signal recorded in the camera. And um, then you can convert that into metadata time code or file time code in post and be able to use that to do the syncing. In the meantime, uh, it's my understanding that, that the receiver doesn't have a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. It's just sending out, it's basically rejamming periodically to the receiver or to the transmitters. So they're talking back and forth. That's my understanding. We'll see when we test it a little bit more. All right. Okay. Are the road lavs the same as Sennheiser's? Um, I think, uh, hmm. well, they're road microphones. So they're, do you mean, are they, are they pinned out the same way? Like, do they use the same connector? Um, they use a 3.5 millimeter TRS connector. I don't know if they're pinned exactly the same, but they are, I believe they're compatible. So if you have a, if you're asking, if, if you have a Sennheiser microphone, I believe it will work in these transmitters. I believe. But 
I would probably just use the ones that are included. These are actually quite good. Um, we did a, we've worked with these a little bit and they're, they sound pretty good. They're EQable. Um, you can get them sounding really, really nice. So that's my take on that. All right. When I pulled out my scissors, I got some advice here. Mark says no running. Joyce says they cut anything. <laughs> Um, Christopher says, glossy like that is poor design choice for something that is often in frame with vloggers, YouTubers, TikTokers. I don't, I don't, yeah, I agree. I, um, a lot of them don't seem to care, but I, I'm not going to do it on corporate videos. So that's why I'll use the lavalier microphones. I think the wireless pro is a better fit for the type of work I do if I'm going to use a 2.4 gigahertz system. Um... Before I get there, I want to I want to come back to this question from Cam Wong. It's a it's a really good one. I think that I went on a fun rant, and there's one important thing I forgot to to cover here. Part of why I don't really consider the wireless pro what I typically think of as pro is because it is a 2.4 gigahertz system. I think I touched on it, but I want to just call it out very directly. 2.4 gigahertz is super convenient, really really nice to work with because it's so simple and easy. However, when it doesn't work, you have zero options to resolve that aside from picking up, going and finding a new, a new place to record where there's not so much 2.4 gigahertz activity and your wireless microphones will work again. So that's pretty rare, to be honest. So it's not, it's not usually a problem, but this becomes especially a problem. Like, for example, if you're at a stadium um, and you're trying to record an interview on the sidelines, that's where these kind of systems are really going to struggle in my experience. That's where a UHF system is a lot better. And there's usually frequency coordination that happens at those kind of events as well. So um, that's where you actually have to check in with the, with the mixing or the audio department there in essence. And they will assign you, if, you, if you're given the rights to do anything with wireless, they will assign you what frequency to use. And that way you have um, a better chance of, of things transmitting correctly. So our 2.4 gigahertz system they may say, yeah, fine, you can go ahead and use that. But if you've got 10,000 or 20,000 other people with their phones on and Wi-Fi going and, you know, in a lot of those stadiums now, they provide a, they provide Wi-Fi access. Um, I just don't see, <laughs> I don't see how um, that's going to be a good, a good situation. So that's, that's, I just wanted to make sure I called that out. Um, again, for corporate work, for news, a lot of times these can be just great. They can be great. Um, so are they not pro? No, well, they're, they're pro in, I think, in a more limited sense than I would normally think of as pro. So, all right. You've done in the past a comparison with Sennheiser XSWD. You showed that Rode had transmission inconsistencies. Would you be able to do the same with Wireless Pro? Yes. Um, so we'll do, we'll do some tests there as well. Um, uh, the, the kind of the acid test is the outdoors where there's no, the no buildings nearby. We'll see how it holds up there. Um, I'll try to get a bunch of other Wi-Fi going in here and just to see how it holds up there as well. So there's, there's more to that. That's definitely coming. Yes. All right, Andrea, I'm unsure you have discussed it already. Could you address the lack of jamming from external device? Do you think it is something that can be fixed in firmware? Please. And thank you. Um, Yeah, I don't think this is really made for those situations. I I don't know whether it could be... Uh, I don't know if a change could be applied in a firmware update. Probably. Probably could read firmware. It probably could read timecode from an external device. But again, remember that the wireless Go does not have... Um, I'm 90% sure it does not have an inbuilt temperature compensated crystal oscillator, which means that you could jam it. You know, if they made it so that you could jam it from an external device... Um, that it's going to drift. Um, and the way it works right now is if it doesn't have a temperature compensated crystal oscillator and it's just using its real-time clock, it's wirelessly communicating with the transmitters to keep them in sync. So that works okay if you're using that kind of closed ecosystem of just the wireless pro. As soon as you bring in another device, you really need to ideally have uh, a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. In other words, a proper time code clock. In the device and at $399 with all the other features they have I'd be very surprised if it does have 
that kind of clock in it. So, all right. Uh, hi, Scooby-Dee. I'm keen to know if Rode have improved the isolation of the receiver. I found that when the GoTo was placed uh, too near to my Sennheiser G-Series receivers, it would pick up some interference. Okay, we'll take a look at that as well and see what we get. Um, yeah, it's probably... I, I doubt that these are sub substantially better shielded internally. The thing is, is that when you have a system like this, tiny little device like this, note there is no external antenna. So the antenna has to be inside. Therefore, they can't get too aggressive about the shielding because the signal has to make it through the plastic casing to get in and out. So um, my educated guess is that that probably would still be an issue. You'd still need to space them out a little bit. Uh, Patrick says, BBC News uses A7S Mark III cameras, and that's not the pro line of cameras like the FX3 or 30. Yeah, that's, yeah. We, When you've got to have a news crew that's got to move quick, these days it seems like most of them are moving to these smaller cameras. They're not even, they're not even, uh, they're not going with the traditional broadcast cameras to a large extent. Michael says, it's amazing that a $400 kit comes with $200 worth of lav mics. I agree. <laughs> the Rode Lavalier 2 has a retail price of $100 and you get two of them. That is pretty, pretty impressive. Rode did a post on YouTube saying they are going to add the ability to jam the wireless pro to another source. Okay, interesting. And Daniel says, I think they mentioned a crystal oscillator in their Q&A video. Um, could be. Uh, I don't know if it's a temperature compensated crystal oscillator, but that, that'd be interesting. Uh, Luca says, do you think they improve the batteries in terms of quality? We have several units of the wireless go to, and about half of them have batteries unusable after just two years. I doubt it, but, uh, I don't have a way to test that. Obviously I don't, I can't do a longevity test for a short term review, but, um, I don't know. That's a problem with these, with these units with built-in batteries. That's definitely a problem. Um, I hope that Rode is able to support those. What is the warranty, by the way? Let's go take a look and see what the warranty is. I'm going to switch on over to the Mac. Okay, here we go. We're going to learn more about the Wireless Pro. Let's do a search for warranty. Hmm. It's going to take us to the warranty page. And you have to log in. So I don't know the answer. To, I don't know what the warranty is on these. I wouldn't be surprised if it's one or two year as opposed to their 10 year. They used to have 10 year and they still have 10 year on some of their higher end microphones, but I don't know about these units. And I think from my point of view, it'd be really, really helpful if they had a, like a, a publicly, uh, you know, a published... They have a, a battery replacement program of some sort, whatever that form that, that needs to take. Um, I'd really appreciate something like that. If you're going to put an inbuilt battery, I, I feel like companies that do that, they need to provide a service to be able to manage that, to, to replace the battery if necessary. That's a problem. All right. Uh, Moto Goyo, great they include the lavalier mics. I find the DJI receivers don't stay in place well enough with their action cameras if using it as a wireless mic. I use the mic itself to record and sync later. All right, and then Christopher notes, Tentacle has released 2.3.0 beta for the Track E. It adds an option to repurpose the headphone output as linear timecode output so you can use it as a sync box in addition to recorder now. Very good. Uh, Bill. <laughs> I'll be darned. I just looked and they renamed the Wireless Go 2 to the Wireless Go Amateur. I don't think so, but that's funny. Um, Okay, as far as I remember, I heard Rode representative on YouTube saying it actually is equipped with temperature compensated crystal oscillator, but I'm not, I am 100% sure it was expressed precisely that way. Okay. And then Christopher says they didn't explicitly say 
TX or TCXO. Anyway, we'll, we'll find out more about that. All right. Ah, Christopher says, this is close to my experience too. Re resolve reading audio time code is terrible, at least with linear time code from my Betsos. It always gets it wrong. Tentacles app reads it just fine. Yeah, the there does need to be some work in DaVinci Resolve on that. That has not been the greatest. Um, Syafiq is looking for a time code generator from Rode. Interesting. Um, hopefully they'll get that message if they, I don't know if they're going to go into that, that, that direction, but that's an interesting idea. Robert Harker, pro? I think the word you're looking for is prosumer. I think that's probably a better way to put it, Robert. Thanks for that. Of course, they're not going to call their product the Rode Wireless Prosumer, <laughs> but I think that's the idea. I think that's a better description of where it fits. Uh, Michael says, I agree about uh, 2.4 gigahertz RF congestion, but that's why it's great to have the onboard 32-bit float recording on the transmitters. Yeah, it'll add more work in post, but at least you'll have the file. You know, I actually think that a valid workflow is to plan on using the recordings from the transmitters and use whatever audio you manage to get to the receiver or to the to the camera as basically your scratch audio. That's one way you can look at it. Um and that's that in that case the time code uh, seems like a pretty valid workflow so in any case right we need to jump to our questions there's a lot more going on here apologies um but let's go over to the questions so that we can cover those that were submitted ahead of time and here we go okay first one up is from jack i have a question about the workflow for systems that incorporate a backup recording with time code like the wireless pro from a mixer's perspective, someone who is booming and recording to a bag. How would the system actually be beneficial? Would you try to turn the mono recordings from the individual units into a polywave after the fact and send those to the client, or would you just include them as a backup for the editor to swap into place as needed? Um, I think you'd need to talk with your post crew and find out what they want, first of all, but I would probably think the latter, more likely just provide them as a backup, or if that's going to be their main you know, you can also work out a time code workflow. If you wanted to record time code to the camera um, and then provide the files, they'll be able to sync them up very simply in post. So I would think the last one would be more common. So again, it's just, it's, it's all about communication in that case and what the post team wants. All right, Chad, my friend that is a guitar maestro. Um, we already covered your question. We're going to come back to that in the final review within the next few weeks here. Chad, it's a great question. Dan asks, I'm wondering what a DPA mic like 4060 would sound like driven by this unit. I asked Rode support how many volts of plug-in power are supplied by the Wireless Pro, and they told me 3.7 volts. So it would need the 4063, which requires less power. Do you think the preamps in this little unit would make it sound noticeably better enough to justify the $500 DPA mic. With this system, I would say probably not, no. If you're going to spend that kind of money, it's probably time to upgrade to a different wireless system. That's my thinking, Dan. Um, the L Rode Lavalier 2 is a pretty good sounding mic. It really is, and you can EQ it and get it sounding really sweet. So I wouldn't... I wouldn't... If, if you're working with a $400 wireless system that comes with two pretty good quality lavalier microphones. I would not spend $500 on a DPA mic as well. All right, this is a more complex, uh, longer question that Marshall submitted, and I just summarized it down to a few things. And I do have some input for you, Marshall, that hopefully will be helpful. Number one, he has four Deity Timecode 1 boxes. He's got those all going into Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras and also recording to a Tascam DR680 with one of those DAD tc ones connected to the fourth channel on the D on the Tascam. Then when he goes into DaVinci Resolve, cannot get Resolve to sync these into a multicam clip. Uh, the first thing I would try, Marshall, is put timecode on the very first channel and then put your microphones after that and see if that works better. Failing that, I would highly... For anyone that's doing a timecode workflow where you're using audio timecode, recording, uh, recording timecode to a microphone input, not a timecode input. 
I think you're probably realistically going to be looking at need, the need to buy an app like Tentacle Sync Studio. It's just, unfortunately, DaVinci Resolves, it works in a, in a handful of cases, but it doesn't work reliably, <clears throat> in my experience, um, across the board. But your best chance of making it potentially work in DaVinci Resolve is moving the time code to track one and see what you get there. So let me know, Marshall, how that works out. Hopefully that's good. Rory asks, uh, this is a completely different question here about the sound devices, MixPre 6.2, and um, he uses it in audio interface mode to receive audio from my Mac computer and send it back to the computer for recording by, for example, GarageBand. Listening, uh, listeners who have used Soundflower or Black Hole or Rogue Amoeba's Loopback will be familiar with doing this. The MixPre manual, page 25, and a few posts on forums suggest that it's possible to record computer audio to a MixPre sound of, um, SD card rather than the computer's recorder. Do one of you or your listeners, do you or one of your listeners know if this is correct or I've misunderstood the reference? If it is correct, how is it done? Some examples when it would be de desirable would be helpful too. So I, I've, I don't really feel like I have a lot of context on what you're trying to achieve, but if you want to record it, what you have to do is set the inputs on your MixPre to one of the USB returns from your computer. So when you go into the input menu, go to the second page for that input menu and where it, it's called, I don't have it set up here. Let's see if we can get this set up here really quickly. I've got a mix pre three here. Get this on camera here. Going to the overhead camera. Here's the mix pre. It's out of focus. So let me see if I can get it in focus. Sorry for the camera shake. Okay, so if I wanted to record the USB from the left USB from the computer, I'd come into input number two. First of all, I'm going to unmute it. Second of all, I'm going to go to the input and I'm going to change it to. USB 1. So that's going to get the audio from the computer there and record that to this channel. Then I'm going to go into the next channel here. I'm going to turn that on and we're going to change it to USB 2. Whoops, there we go, right there. Also, I need to unmute that channel. And then I also need to arm it if I want to record it. Same with the first one, arm it. And then, of course, set your gain and so on and so forth. And that will get you recording those. That's, that's, that's the general idea. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Rory, thanks for the question. All right, John says, is the RX phase module available within Audition? I have RX 10 standard and the latest Audition, and I don't see it. I can apply it through the RX standalone app. Am I missing something? John, you are not missing something. The phase module is a, an offline processor, so it cannot work in Adobe Audition or most other DAWs. So you do have to get it, you do have to run it within the standalone app, which is called RX Audio Editor. So you're not missing anything. That's exact, that's intended. It's just because Audition doesn't have an interface to support offline processing from external plugins like that. Okay, all right, cool, we got the questions. Let's go back to the chat. We have just a couple of seconds here. <laughs> all right. All right. Jazz says, I love my Rode products, but this welcome edition is not pro level. I have no doubt Rode could produce a pro gear line. Absolutely. Yeah, I think right now they're um, they're going after a prosumer market here. That's exactly what they're doing. Bill confer, uh, confirms the warranty is a one-year warranty. All right, Chris asks, is the Lumix XLR1 still worth picking up to get in Cam Audio and integrate Rode Pro Go to and Tentacle Sync? My F3 doesn't integrate with anyone other than Atomos. Sorry, my F3. Um, 
problem with the XLR1 is it was the preamps were a little noisy in my experience. I don't think they're going to improve the audio quality that you get from the wireless pro in my opinion. I mean, yeah, XLR connectors are are not in and of themselves indica indicative of better audio quality. <laughs> um so no, it's it, that's not gonna. I don't think that's gonna improve your overall signal chain. It's probably just gonna make it more complicated, Chris. That's my take on it. All right, Scooby D. In regards to spacing out the wireless Go Two and the Sennheisers, um, yeah, you got to play some. I think that's probably gonna be the case again on the new ones here. Placing them apart does the job. All right. Paul says, uh, don't you think that the combination of built-in recording, 32-bit recording, and time code, at least when the RX is plugged into the camera, basically negates any limitations of wireless transmission? Um, yeah, if you're doing a post workflow, yes. If you're doing live, no. Um, but yeah, for, for post workflows, I think that's fine. If, if, if that's the intention of your workflow, you go into it very intentionally thinking of it that way, then yeah, I think that's an absolute, that's a great workflow. I'm excited to try out the 32-bit float recording and see how well it holds up. Um, see how well that microphone in the recorder itself, or the transmitter itself, or the, um, the lavalier 2 holds up in those circumstances. All right. Where is that MixPre desk stand available? So this is called the Sound Devices PIX-E stand. And um, let me just show it again here. It's not cheap. I think it was like hundred and $140 or something. It's it's not cheap, but it is solid metal. It's incredibly well built. It was a one of the better investments I've made <laughs> for education purposes for showing things. And it also makes it easy to easier to operate your MixPre or other recorder. I actually use it for my Zoom recorders, um, which is funny because it's Sound Devices branded, but um, <laughs> um, it's a really nice stand. So it, you'll see the price. You'll probably choke when you first see the price, but I can tell you that the price is is worth it if you're gonna if it's gonna get a lot of use. All right, Patrick says, with this dual lav system, how can I keep the channels separate with just a 3.5 millimeter jack and bring in time code? Can I bring audio? into my sound devices 633 so not directly there was a mode there where you could send time code out of the usb output um, and then keep the the actual audio channels separated so one to left and one to right so that's one way you could potentially do it if you need to if you have a way to get that usb time code in an into your you know jammed up with your 633 in some fashion but i don't I don't really know. I haven't looked into what that USB time code does and how it works exactly. So we'll have to look into that a little bit more, Patrick. Okay, let's see here. Does RODELOV2 work with a Sennheiser G3 transmitter? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I will say this, I plugged the Rode Lavalier 2 into, oh, whoops, let me get back over here. I plugged the Rode Lavalier 2 into a DJI mic, and it did not work. So I don't know whether, I don't have a G3 on hand to test that, unfortunately, Matt. Sorry about that. Maybe somebody else here in the chat knows that. Okay, so Birds of Ray... Um, Ray Martinez. So this system transmits and records at the same time, and the Theos doesn't. That's correct. Um, my understanding, you, if you're curious about the details, you should go look up the patents from Zaxcom and exactly what they include. There are several of them. Um, my understanding is that one of the issues is that what Zaxcom specifically patented, at least one of the issues, is that um, if you record to removable memory media, and transmit at the same time. That's covered by their patent. So you have to license that technology from them until their patent expires. The difference here with the Rode Wireless Go, and, and 
they, you know, this is testing the patent system. I don't, as far as I know, Zaxcom has not gone after Rode yet. And they've had, they had the recording functionality on the wireless go too. So that's been a couple of years now. Um, but they don't have removable media in the Rode wireless pro or the wireless go to. So I think that's how they get around the patent or that's at least how they justify getting around it. I don't know that it's been tested in court yet, but that's, that's the thinking. Yes. Okay. Uh, Billy asks, I have a mix pre 10 two and using a tentacle tracky as backup recording from the X1, X2 output, but only get left mix. Is there a way to get left, right mix out using a different backup recorder? Um, yes, you should be able to get left. That's just output routing. Um, let's take a look here. Let's get this mix pre fired back up. There's the three, of course, but the same idea should apply. So if I come into my menu and I go to my output menu and make sure the stereo mute's off, of course. Um, I just have to make sure my routing is set up here correctly. So I have a just a 3.5 millimeter out, which is equivalent to the X1, X2 out on the Mix Pre 10 2. Just make sure that left mix is on the first one. And then, or, oh, this is sending right, or left to both of them. And then I would have to come over here and make sure that right mix is going into the, the right output. So that's the main thing there. If you want to send me screenshots of your screen, you know, how, how the routing is set up. If you're still stuck, Billy, let me know. You're welcome to email me and we can work through that together. All right. Fachiri says, I'm pretty sure the USB time code is for things like phones and tablets. That's my guess as well. Um, Steve says, uh, looks like you're having a conversation there with Mark. Um, Daniela says you can easily solder your cables to the proprietary Chinese connectors of DJI or others. If you know how to solder. And if you don't, it'd be good to learn. Jazz says, I think we're all crying out for time code standard and universal application that all manufacturers could abide by and implement from recorders, cameras, and nonlinear editors. Yes. Um, Tentacle Sync Studio seems to be that app. It's not, it's not free, but it is, uh, it, it works really well. You can actually tell it which channel to look at for the audio time code and it will convert it. And it you can actually... Um, there are a lot of really nuanced uh, settings in that. You can really tune it in, but it, it generally out of the box, you just drum, dump your audio files in, dump your camera files in, and it figures it out in nine out of 10 cases. And then where you don't, it's... <clears throat> anyway, it's it works really, really well. So, all right, friends, we need to get back to making sound. I'm really glad we had this chance to talk together today. Obviously, again, I've got a lot more to do on the Rode Wireless Pro as far as investigating. Looks like a great product for the right use cases. I would, again, I would call it a prosumer um, product. Uh, could, there are a lot of use cases where it would be a, a, a good fit from my point of view. Um, so more to come on that. In the meantime, get out there, make some great sound, and we will talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.